Hi everybody, welcome to this first recorded lecture that you'll of the recordings that you'll be watching this semester before you come to class. As mentioned in the syllabus and as we probably talked about it together, this first week is about the idea of flourishing. Um, specifically in this recording, we're going to talk about the idea of what it means for a human being to flourish. Um, we'll uh, go through this together in the recording, looking at different perspectives of, of how we measure whether or not a person is flourishing. And then when we come together in class, we'll discuss these materials, but then also go through a case together about why Polaroid Corporation, the photography company, why it failed and what lessons there are about flourishing in that case. I want you to begin, though, by asking yourself this question. What does it mean for someone to flourish? More specifically, what does it mean for you to flourish? When you think about flourishing, you think about all the things that would be part of what you would require for yourself to consider yourself a flourishing person, what would those things be? Or consider instead, what does it mean for someone close to you, a loved one, to flourish? Someone who you know well. What does it mean for them to live a flourishing life? Tolstoy said this at the beginning of his book, Anna Karenina, happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Now, I think there are different ways to perceive what Tolstoy was saying here, but I think what he was saying is that there are common elements to human well-being. A happy family is happy because it has the things necessary for happiness. And those things are common to all human beings. Health, financial stability, uh, positive relationships, uh, uh, hope for the future. These are all the sorts of things that make us happy. And a happy family, having all those things, is going to look very similar to other happy families. But if even just one of these elements is missing or damaged um, or diminished in some way, then you'll find yourself not being happy and your unhappiness will look different from that of somebody else. In fact, that's been true in our own lives. If you think about moments of your unhappiness, they probably haven't all been identical, meaning at some moments when you're unhappy, there was a particular reason that didn't that, that wasn't the same as a as a moment of unhappiness later on, and so our unhappiness can look uh, can appear in lots of different ways, but happiness is formed from those common things that all of us need to be happy. Now you may be wondering at this point why we're talking about this in the context of a of a class about helping, and especially why we're talking about such sort of high-minded and philosophical ideas about what it means for people to flourish. Well, in a very practical sense, uh, the point I want to make with this lecture and I will make throughout this semester is the only help that matters is what helps people to flourish. What I mean by this is not that your help is no good unless you take somebody from a non-flourishing to a flourishing state. In fact, I think that's a misperception of what it means to flourish. I think flourishing is measured more on a continuum where the higher you, up the continuum you go, the more, you, the more you're flourishing, and the lower you go, the less you're flourishing. But for help to actually be helpful, for it to have meaning or purpose in any way, it needs to relate to the things that matter to us most. And those factors that feed into our flourishing qualify as those things. So help that's focused on flourishing is real help. And in fact, if it, you know, we're going to talk a lot about where help fails and why help can sometimes be bad help. Um, it's almost always going to reveal itself as bad help because it fails to improve human flourishing. And it need not be dramatic. It need not take somebody from a miserable state to a, to a blissful state. To the contrary, even small things we do can move people up the scale of human flourishing. A recent study showed that there's been lots of research to show that that meaningful relationship clo that close meaningful relationships are one of the strongest predictors of happiness but there's also been recent research to show that even distant connections or relationships not physically but sort of like less important to us in our lives even those can improve our happiness one study measured this by just measuring how many times a day people said hi to you and so the participants Took, kept track of that. And the more people said hi to you, the more likely you were to be happy. So even little things like saying hi can have a, a measurable effect on a person's overall well-being. And so I want you to have that perspective as we think about this. Small and big ways of helping all matter to the extent that they improve human flourishing. So let's dig into this together. Let's start by talking about what philosophers have to say. 
perhaps the oldest perspective, most widely known and oldest perspective on, on flourishing comes from the philosopher Aristotle. And Aristotle developed this idea of eudaimonia. And eudaimonia is this idea of um, a state of excellence of, 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 of your personhood. It's, it's, a, it's a measure of how much you're flourishing focused on a good person living a good life or what he described being in a condition of good spirit. It's the idea that human beings have a potential and eudaimonia is reaching that full state, uh, that complete uh, state uh, of human potential, uh, sort of le leaving nothing unimproved that might be improved. Uh, as Aristotle thought, what are the kinds of virtues or attributes that lead a person into this state of eudaimonia? It's uh, uh, virtues like courage and temperance and wisdom and justice. And, uh, and, and you know, these are what are called the four cardinal virtues. We could add to it uh, knowledge um, uh, and, uh, and other factors, right? He's a philosopher, so that's why he would care about that. But the overall point is that it's sort of a state of completeness of, of being a human being. And so that's why he said the happy life is thought to be one of excellence. Now, fast forwarding uh, almost a couple thousand years, uh, we introduced the idea, the philosophical idea of utility. So this, come, this idea of utility comes from the utilitarian moral philosophy, first developed by Jeremy Bentham and then carried on and enhanced by John Stuart Mill. And this is who you're saying is Mill. Uh, the idea of utilitarianism is uh, that the thing that matters most is utility or happiness and that our goals should be to maximize happiness and minimize its opposite. Bentham actually tried to even develop a measuring system for this, and his units of measure were what he called utils, U-T-I-L-S, for utility, and then sort of disutility or unhappiness, he, he characterized with units called dolors, D-O-L-O-R-S. The idea being that, that uh, you want to maximize the number of utils in your life and minimize the number of dolors. Now, this is a pretty hedonistic way to see well-being, like kind of anything that brings you happiness is now morally desirable. Mill enhanced utilitarianism to argue that utility really derives from a plurality of goods like freedom, relationships, personal development, justice, and all these factors feed into our overall happiness or utility. And so there's more to it than just sort of hedonistic uh, living, like, you know, um, satisfying all of your basest pleasures. Uh, Mill recognized and argued that it isn't that alone that makes us happy, but the things that ma maximize our happiness are things of deeper meaning, like the list here. Still, though, even if we take his perspective of a plurality of goods leading to our happiness, Mill did say and argue that utility is and should be our goal for us to live a moral life. And in fact, he described it this way. He described this as the creed, which accepts as the foundation of morals, utility, or the greatest happiness principle, and that it holds actions as right in proportion as they tend to promote happiness and wrong as they tend to produce the reverse of happiness. So this isn't just a measure of flourishing, but it also therefore creates a moral philosophy, a way that we ought to live. And the way he argued we ought to live is by maximizing people's overall utility and uh, instead of doing things which might produce the opposite of that. And this idea of utility has bled into a lot of the way we see the world and, and really fundamental things like in policy, you have cost-benefit analysis. In economics, economists actually use actively this idea of utility. And they, they, one of the fundamental assumptions of economics is that human beings maximize, they make rational decisions to maximize their own utility. We'll see this idea show up later. All right, let's talk, move from the philosophers to the psychologists. Now, this is going to bring us to much more modern perspectives on measuring flourishing. The first is a measure called subjective well-being. And this is a, this is a measure of, of happiness or flourishing developed by a psychologist named Ed Diener. Uh, Dr. Diener uh, uh, essentially showed that you can measure happiness just by asking people how happy they are. In fact, it's just usually measured as a 1 to 10 scale over time before or after key life events. 
But the essence is you just ask people how happy they are on a scale of 1 to 10. So this measure is now called the Subjective Well-Being Measure, or SWB for short. It's simplistic and maybe inaccurate and subjective as it sounds. It's even in the name. The reality is this measure is surprisingly consistent. That is to say, over time, it behaves in predictable ways. People answer in predictable ways when they're given this SWB measure. Um, and it ties itself to life events in predictable ways, meaning that if uh, you've been, if you're married, the research shows you're on average likely to be happier, and you see that show up in SWB measures. And if you've had an adverse health event that's uh, led to a chronic health problem, on average you'll be less happy, and that shows up in SWB measures. So even though it seems silly to just measure happiness by asking people how happy they are. That's the essence of this measure. And it turns out it's surprisingly useful and consistent. It's not perfect. Um, one of the problems with this measure is that it's prone to what's called hedonic adaptation, which is to say we get accustomed to our circumstances. And so there are things that happen in our life that either move our happiness measure up or down, our SWB measure up or down. But given enough time, we sort of level out and those things stop being as important to us. Increases in income tend to, this, this, this hedonic adaptation seems to be especially true for income levels, for example. And so beyond a, a level of income that provides for your most important needs, increased wealth tends to not make you happier in sustainable ways. And so at least not according to an SWB measure. And there might be other things that aren't necessarily captured in that measure. Um, another problem with the SWB measure is that it's prone to dispositional factors. And this actually reveals kind of an unsettling truth, which is that um, some people, according to the research, are just naturally happier than other people. Not for anything they're doing, not because of their circumstances, just because of who they are by their nature, whether that's sort of baked in genetically or, or however you want to think about it. Some people are just dispositionally happier than others, which means the people who are on the wrong end of that are, are dispositionally less happy or, or more unhappy than others. Those people kind of get the short end of the stick and they live their life being on average less happy for reasons that probably have nothing to do with their choices. Uh, Diener makes this great point, though, is that happiness is perceived. And he said it appears that the way people perceive the world is much more important to happiness than their objective circumstances. Uh, the second um, psychological measure of human flourishing uh, comes from a psychologist named uh, Martin Seligman. Dr. Seligman is a positive psychologist. He's actually one of the sort of parents of this whole uh, branch of, posit of psychology called positive psychology. And he developed and wrote about a five-factor model. These are five things that predict a human, flir a human being be uh, flourishing. And these are positive emotion, engagement, relationships, meaning, and achievement. And so you can see that's why it's called PERMAS, because it's an acronym of those five things. So, so how much positive emotion are you experiencing? How engaged are you with the things going on in your life? Do you find them exciting, interesting? How, how high is the quality of your relationships? How much meaning or purpose do you find in the things that you do? And are you experiencing and looking forward to a sense of achievement or accomplishment or growth? And so these are the five factors that measure this. He wrote a book called Flourish that I'd recommend if you're interested in learning more. It's a very insightful book. A uh, drawback of the PERMA model is it doesn't directly measure non-psychological factors like finances, health, and so forth. Theoretically, those if those things went badly in your life, they would show up in your PERMA measure, but we don't directly measure those things with the PERMA measure, so it doesn't tell us if you've had an, a decrease in, in this positive emotion factor, for example. It doesn't tell us why. We'd have to find out why. And so it doesn't directly measure uh, so non-psychological factors like we talked about. As the father of positive psychology, uh, Seligman is fascinated with the things that make us happy. One of the things is, is showing kindness to others. So um, as a helper, you can be confident in the fact that being a helper also makes you happier. He said this, here's the exercise. Find one wholly unexpected thing, kind, sorry, one unexpected kind thing to do tomorrow and just do it. And then notice what happens to your mood. And it, according to science, your mood will improve. All right, let's talk about flourishing according to economists. And I'm not going to highlight any specific economists, but I am going to highlight two very common economic measures that we use today as a way to measure the well-being of, of, of humans. Uh, we're going to talk about gross domestic product and the Gini coefficient. 
So GDP or gross domestic product is a measure, uh, usually measured at the country level of a country's economic production and goods and services as measured by dollars. And so when you work at a job and they pay you a salary, that salary is a reflection of economic productivity and that goes into the GDP measure. Now, uh, for measuring human well-being, we usually do this measure on a per capita basis, which means we take the overall productivity of an economy, like in a country in the United States, and then we divide it up by the population. And so to, to get a GDP per capita measure, we take the overall productivity divided by the population. That tells us how much productivity there is on average per person. Now, that produces a mean, which is not exactly... Uh, an entirely useful measure, and that tells us uh, uh, some of the problems with GDP or GDP per capita. It doesn't capture uh, informal value is a problem. I said it gets captured in dollars, where there are a lot of things we do for each other that don't get measured by dollars. Uh, giving a friend a ride to the airport is not measured in GDP. Um, you know, like somebody consoling you at the end of a hard day is not measured in GDP. These all obviously improve our, our overall well-being, but they don't get measured in this measure. The other problem is this doesn't measure income distribution. And so, like I said, it's just a mean, an average amount of GDP per capita is, is what we get from this. And, and that's not telling us who's got the money. It just tells us on average across the, across the economy, um, you know, what's the average amount of money per person. That doesn't tell us how the money is actually distributed. And that's what this second measure is for, the Gini coefficient. So this is a measure of income inequality. This is figuring out within economy, within an economy, how much of it is controlled by how many people. And so with, with this coefficient measure, zero means that, and that's the desirable end of it, means that everybody has equal income. And a one means there's just one single person who has all the income. Obviously an economy that's hugely productive, but where only one person gets all the benefits of that productivity is an undesirable state. And there will be a lot of misery there. Now, the Gini coefficient, on its part, doesn't capture overall economic production, just how it's distributed. And so, for example, if you have an economy that only produced a dollar in value, um, even if you d divided that dollar up across the entire population, uh, it's going to give you a Gini coefficient of zero, but you're going to have a lot of misery because there's not enough actual economic productivity. So these two measures are most useful when you combine them together. And that's what this uh, chart does. This comes from Our World in Data. You can go to the website and play around with this information if you want. It's quite fun. Um, but, uh, well, maybe you won't think it's fun. I think it's fun. <laughs> so uh, what you see on this chart is the y-axis is a Gini coefficient. Remember, the higher up you go on the y-axis, the less equal the income is distributed. So higher up means less equality more more inequality the the uh, x-axis is gdp per capita so this is the average amount of of productivity or inc economic value per person um, you'll notice that along the uh, x-axis we move kind of on a log scale because uh, you know the wealthy countries are quite a bit wealthier than the poor countries in our world um, and then if you're wondering the size of the circle is a reflection of the overall population so that's why china's circle is the biggest followed by india's um, where you want to be theoretically on this chart is in the bottom right corner. That is to say, you know, near the Netherlands, Belgium, so forth. This is where you have high levels of average income per person and that the income that is in that country is divided more equally so that you don't have a high concentration of wealth with just a few people. All right. Like I said, you can go to the website here, Our World in Data, to play around with the information. Let's uh, add some more uh, dimensions to the way we think about and measure uh, flourishing by looking at the way flourishing is measured according to governments. Specifically, we're going to talk about how the United Nations measures flourishing. We're going to look at two measures. One is the Human Development Index, or the HDI, and the other is the Sustainability Development Goals. Uh, HDI is measured by on a scale of 0 to 1, so it's an index measure on a scale from 0 to 1 according to three dimensions. The first one is, are you living a long and healthy life? That's measured by life expectancy at birth. We sort of know on average how long a person is going to live depending on where they're born. The second uh, dimension of this is being knowledgeable, and we measure that by two things. The average adult years of schooling, so how long did the average adult spend in school, and then also the expected years of schooling for children. Um, 
And then the last factor is having a decent standard of living. And so this is a financial measure. It interestingly uses a log of gross national income, which is another kind of measure like GDP. And the reason it uses a log scale is because as you move up the income scale, income has less of an impact on your overall happiness. So this diminishes the value of income as income increases. At small levels of income, it has a huge impact on your well-being. At higher levels of income, it has a smaller impact on your overall well-being. And this, this, this log measure accommodates for that. The sustainability development goals aren't a measure like the other ones we've already talked about. Instead, these are 17 factors for overall human well-being and the health of our planet that the UN is prioritizing as uh, it thinks about what pu public policy uh, we create, how we allocate resources, how we want to improve the world, essentially. And so it focuses, these 17 goals focus on things like income, health, education, environment, and equality issues. Even though there are 17 goals or categories of activity, these are measured by hundreds of specific indicators. So if we get into like a health measure, for example, we would get into uh, life expectancy at birth or child mortality, which is how likely is a child to die before the age of five. And then we might even dig deeper into that, like what are the kinds of chronic or infectious diseases that people encounter and at what rates. And so this is where you get into the nitty gritty of the sustainability development goals. Uh, this, t this uh, map shows you the HDI uh, from 2021. Uh, dark colors <clears throat> mean you're closer to zero. Lighter colors mean you're closer to one. One is the desirable end to be on. And so you can see where, according to those three factors, people are doing less well uh, by, by the darkness of the color on the map. Um, <clears throat> these are the 17 sustainable development goals. Uh, you can go to the UN website and dig into uh, quite a bit of information uh, on how those work. Now, all of these that we've talked about up to this point, everything from the philosophers to the psychologists to the economists to governments, uh, we have seen all these different ways of seeing human flourishing. And what you'll notice is that it focused from a particular lens, a particular perspective on what it means for a person to flourish. Uh, what would it look like if we developed a more comprehensive approach to flourishing measures that's not taking a very particular lens, but maybe a broader perspective or lens? Well, this is what the Harvard Center for Human Flourishing has been developing, and they've created the Harvard Flourishing Measure. You're actually going to use this measure in an exercise that you have uh, coming up after this day of class. This is a newer measure. It's designed to consider the broader human experience, and in this effort is led by Dr. Tyler Vanderweel, who actually has a background in data science and public health, and, uh, but also the study of religion. And, uh, and he's brought together a very eclectic group of experts to look at a broader way of thinking about human flourishing. Their, mo their measure has a six-factor model. How happy or satisfied are you with your life? What's the quality of your mental and physical health? How much meaning and purpose are you experiencing? Do you live with a consistent character and high virtue? Do you engage in close social relationships and are you experiencing financial and material stability? This, as you can see, sort of pulls in elements from all the other measures we've looked at. You can see economic and psychological and even philosophical measures here. And all of these represent this broader way of thinking about what it means for a person to flourish. In fact, Dr. Van de Weel said this, humans are complex beings and flourishing is a tapestry woven by a harmony of diverse threads. I love that way of thinking about flourishing. And in the spirit of that, I want you to think about is there anything missing? Is there anything we've talked about in this video about what it is that makes a person flourish that we haven't covered? As we were talking about all of these, were you thinking about people in your life that you care about? And were you thinking of, oh man, they could really use more of this or they could use less of this? Uh, let's talk about this together. For example, we didn't really cover spirituality directly in any of those measures. And how important are those things, are, are spiritual things to our overall happiness and well-being? Anyway, think this through and then come to class ready to talk about additional ways of perceiving our own flourishing and the flourishing of others. Now, again, all this is to give you a broader way of thinking about what it means to help others in meaningful ways. And so I hope this has accomplished that and I'll see you in class.